Welcome everyone to the Engineer Whisperer podcast. I'm excited, so excited to have you here today because I have a special guest with me today. Anthony, welcome to the podcast. Andrea, thanks for having me. I am looking forward to asking you a lot of questions, but before we start, tell us a little bit about you. Well, Andrea and your audience, my name is Anthony New, simply spelled N-E-W. I was born in Pusan, South Korea, adopted as a young infant and raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I attended the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. Uh, I spent over two decades, not quite three decades in the U.S. Army as an infantry officer and just recently retired less than a month ago. And I'm currently living here in Salem, Oregon with my wife of almost 24 years and our daughter who's a teenager. We've got a son who's 11 and our youngest, he showed up six weeks early on April Fool's Day and he turns eight uh, next Monday. Oh, so happy birthday for him. Yes, less than a week. I have a friend who was born in the first two. Amazing. Well, I brought, I, I invited you here today because you said something that really caught my curiosity last time we have spoken. And I know that you, your background is not in engineering and you asked me, well, can I still come? And I said, yes, of course, because one, you're working on it. But you said something about the first class leader and that in the military, you have gained that level. And I'm so curious of what that means. So I wanted you to come here and let's discuss it. Let's find out more and let's see how it connects with, in, in, connect into the business world. So Anthony, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? How did you get there? Let's start at the beginning. Well, I think if we, before we get to that, if we get to how you latched on to the first class leader thing, uh, I just explained because just because my new civilian title is industrial territorial sales engineer has engineer in it, I wouldn't consider myself a first class PhD level engineer. And I just want to give deference to that. I do have a civil engineering undergrad um, and will continue to learn and grow and leverage the experts in my organization that I'm currently employed in. Um, but I use that to parallel where I respect that and understand um, the level of training, education, and experience it takes for, you know, what we would label a first class, second class, or even third class uh, person of engineering background. And I would argue that someone with my level of experience, training, and education, you know, I can make a parallel that I may not be a third first class engineer, but I could argue that um, myself and my peers could, you could say, are a first class leader uh, based on our Army experiences and training and education and all that we've gone through. So, there's where that came from. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, what was your journey like to to become um, that leader? Tell us more. Well, as a newly commissioned second lieutenant in the United States Army in the infantry. So when you think of infantry, just think that's pretty much what people think of the Army. So at age 22 and a half, you're arguably, you know, we would call a, an an organizational level leader right from the start, where if uh, you have the individual contributor executing a task and their supervisor is the direct leader of an individual executing a task or purpose, at age 20, less than 23, you already have multiple uh, supervisors that you are the leader of. So you, right up from the gate, are a leader of leaders. At that young age, oh, wow. So how did you grow in your leadership? That's what I'm curious about. And and because um, you put in the years after that. So maybe what were some of the methods or tools that you discovered or you beca they became available to you? Tell me more. I can only count to three. So I'll keep it to three topics of tr the, the theme of training, education, and experience. So you have, at the, that young age, you've got a uh, pretty good, very exceptional academic education and some military education and some military training. But what you severely lack is experience. So what the Army does to help you, in many cases, even throughout most of my career, is they give you someone with an immense amount of experience to be your right-hand 
principal advisor. And at the young ripe age of 23, I had a non-commissioned officer with a lot of experience who was in fact my right hand principal advisor to help shore up those three pillars. And throughout our career, your the Army sees that as leveraging that team partnership of you as the de facto end all leader responsible for everything that that organization does or fails to do, but advised by someone with a lot of experience. So at the young age, how do you build a relationship that that is really built on trust and, and, and deep connection with someone that you don't know yet, who you are aware of has way more experience than you. So you could be thinking, oh, I'm just not, you know, who am I? I'm so low and small and 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 weak at that point, um, or maybe weak in, in self-confidence. So how did you build that? Glad you brought up trust several times. So again, I'm gonna keep keep it to three points of trust, humility, and self-awareness. So Trust in the military is paramount. We could go on and on for days and weeks about trust and how trust is at the core of every single thing we do. Uh, and by and large, there's an automatic baseline of trust when someone, everyone raises the right hand and, and swears an oath to defend the Constitution. So there's a baseline of trust there uh, that you obviously need to gain and I think one of the, the best ways you can gain that is through demonstrating your humility. Again, at age 23, you may be in charge. You may be responsible for everything that organization does or fails to do. But if you don't have that humility, that organization can, they can, they can make your life very difficult. Um, well, how you do you need, get that humility? need to have the self-awareness even at such a young age. So... I think arguably the humility and self-awareness comes through repetition. And really, if you have the humility to accept that while you may be in charge, that you have a lot to learn because you lack experience. And even your training and education still does not entitle you or make you an automatic leader. Oh, I see. So to doing the things that may be new, but you keep repeating them and consistently learning about yourself and, and thus gaining the experience and, and, and growing in that and growing together with someone. All right. What was maybe something challenging for you in, um, in this experience? I was very fortunate to have my principal advisor who had a lot of experience and and had other young officers like me that he had already trained and and helped become successful. So I truly think one thing I think that I've that stuck with me throughout is, you know, good leaders are also good in some cases even better followers or subordinates. Uh for someone to think that they're just in charge, that they're the end all be all, that they don't have to follow the rules or that they don't have to demonstrate the ability and model, role model, that you are a good follower, a good subordinate, undermines your credibility. Because at the end of the day, everyone has a boss. Or, you know, our, I joke with our young boys, they're like, does the president have a boss? I'm like, of course, there's this thing called balance of power. And, you know, the people, of course, like, but he's the president. Yeah, but everyone has a boss. And if you are a good subordinate and a good follower, that, in my opinion, in assessment and experience, is a requirement to be a good leader. I see. So was that then easy for you or difficult for you to to get that mindset of of, of you can be a leader and you can be a follower too? That's where I ought to bring in self-awareness, that you're self-aware that in order to grow, you need to make mistakes and own those mistakes and have the humility to make those, to own those, but also show and demonstrate that you're willing to learn and not just willing to learn from the people who are senior to you, 
but you know, I had a boss who said every every person is my superior, and I might learn something from them, which brings in again that humility that even you know several decades into the military, you recognize that you can learn something from someone else who may be at a lower you know echelon than you and training your experience and and that demonstrating that humility that I think empowers and gains a trust that, hey, this person may be the boss and everybody knows that. You don't need to lean on that. If you have the humility to understand that each person can bring something and help make you better and you in turn help make them better, gains and forges a stronger trust through that humility and self-awareness and being a good follower and a good learner. So do you have a good story that that shows how maybe how you learned through through mm. something that you went through? Well, I, I would like to share something that I thought of uh, before is, so as the young 23 year old, you're automatically and, you know, a leader of leaders. And I think the next level, the stories from the next level were in your you know, almost 30 years old, you're a leader of three or four of those lieutenants. So if you recall at 23, uh, you're, a lead, you're a leader of leaders. And that person's leader, I'm gonna jump to that person's leader. So when I was that person's leader, a leader of a hand, three or four, 23 year olds who had their own organizations of 30 approximately people. Um, one of the lessons I that that pulls from me is, you know, when when you give at the end of the day, that individual contributor, the task, it has to go through leaders and leaders of leaders to the end of the day. And I remember recall giving a task to a team uh, and, and they executed it and they performed the task and they were really trying their hardest. Now, when I went to uh, see the, what they had done and performed, it wasn't exactly what I envisioned. Now this is the this has stuck with me for a long time because this could have went multiple directions. They did their best effort based on the instructions and guidance I'd give them through a leader, through a leader, through a leader. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't exactly what I would have done. So a couple key points from that is um, one to reinforce that they did their if they in fact did their best effort, then recognize that that they did their best effort. Um, and resist at that moment providing any critical feedback or that could be deemed as uh, hurtful or corrections or comments that could be taken taken inappropriately or the wrong way. Because remember, in this case, they tried their best, right? So recognize and their best first. Recognize their best effort. I'm going to tie this back to uh, humility and self-awareness. So recognizing their best effort uh, helps build the trust that you trusted them with the task and that they you trust that they did their best. Oh, yeah. um, another comment is if, you know, ask yourself if everyone uh, was as good as you or would have done it the exact way you would have, then you're just average and then you don't deserve to be the leader. So there's, as the leader, mm -hmm. you should be, having more training education experience and should be able to do it at a better level or why are you the leader um oh, and the I third see. part is ties back to self-awareness you know perhaps perhaps you or me at the time gave unclear instructions or poor guidance or didn't supervise the execution that's the self-awareness and humility yeah. that'll help gain the trust if in fact they did their best and then do some self-reflection on what could have I done better to communicate what I desired as the task completion. So first reflection, ref uh, recognition outwards, recognize their efforts, that they did their best, then almost recognize that, yes, there is a gap between them and me in the case that as a leader, I have more training, um, experience, and education. What an interesting point. I haven't thought about the second one. And then the third one is that um, to, to have the, the humility to ask myself, okay, 
what on my end I could have done differently, communicated differently to then get a different result and outcome. Wow, what an interesting process there. So so as you're going through these three, the first one is is the, the I would say the words come out. You will recognize them. With the with the last two, like I'm so curious, after you recognized the team, like what would you say next? How would you like would you try to improve their outcome or or give them more instructions so that they improve the outcome? Like what what would what what happened next? Glad you asked that, Andrea, because again, you could approach this many different ways. You could recognize the effort and then immediately transition, or you could take a pause in space and time and let them enjoy their victory if they truly in fact did their best and then reflect on how can I better communicate this? And is this a situation where with space and time, I wanna go back in and help improve the outcome of the task they did. And one way of helping improve the outcome and reinforcing their training, education, and their experience that they just did, because that's an experience, and they're going to be take away their own takeaways from that as future leaders or even current leaders. Someone had to be in charge of that group that did the task for them. So someone was a leader, and the others are arguably future leaders, is to ask them for their own feedback. I mean, how many times have you heard someone say, I am my own worst critic? You heard that? <laughs> oh, I hear that all the time with my clients. And yeah, that shows up for me too. I have to be honest. Like, yes, I always go to- if You can infuse ownership. Yes. Perhaps you may need to clarify the desired outcome or just reiterate, okay, hey, here was the task. It, the guy, I told you X, Y, and Z. Is that what you heard? Yes, we heard X, Y, and Z. Okay. Well, how do you think you did in achieving X, Y, or Z? Nine times out of 10, they're going to be very self-critical of them own selves. And so then again, they may, they will identify how they can improve and take ownership. You can also play that a couple of ways. You could say, oh yeah, you're absolutely right. You really messed that up. Or you could say that I agree with you. However, look how much you did in a positive manner uh, that got you to make that actually accomplished it. Not, not a hundred percent, not perfect. And you were your own critic, but I'm going to reinforce the positive and and uh, also agree with your the right level of criticism to improve as as an individual or team. Wow, I love that m mindset and that process, Anthony, because instead of a leader giving feedback to a team who just accomplished something, you create the space. And the opportunity for the team to self-reflect and thus almost give their feedback first. And you're right. We are our most hmm, crucial feedback givers. We we beat ourselves down uh, almost even if we hear a good feedback. So I love it's like you're interrupting the process of I put myself down with I I say the words and I I acknowledge almost like because when we say it out loud, there's something changes than when we think about it. So, you know, we move the thought and the feeling into our pre pre -cort, prefront cortex. So then we become more aware that we are really self-critical. And when there's someone else there to witness that, and then that person gives us the grace to also recognize where we did good, then it 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 grows our confidence. So I I love this this process that you shared. And I really hope that our listeners will take a minute and and um reflect on how powerful this could be with any team, any engineering and any business team. Thanks for sharing. I could probably sum up that takeaway for me is, is ownership. Ownership. As a leader, 
imagine that everyone had ownership at the appropriate level for their own scope of work that fed the bigger picture. So in there, I think you can help achieve ownership and pride and trust through your humility and self-awareness and, and their development. Yes, that's that alignment that when we all have ownership, we align to the uh, we align to the bigger mission and that is how almost like we remove the obstacles for information to be clogged up. So the information route also becomes clearer. It flows better. And then it becomes a loop, that feedback loop and ownership loop. And if if I have ownership over something and I feel that I didn't have, I didn't get enough information, I would go and ask for clarification, more information, I don't know, more resources, uh, because I want the outcome to reflect my ownership and my proud proudness in the ownership and in the result. I can see all being connected. Now, what was something that you were surprised maybe by in, in becoming a leader of leaders and as you climbed, as you moved higher and higher in the military? I'll, I'll pull out a theme about communication. Clear, concise, and frankly, even extreme judicious communication the higher you go up. So along the theme of communication, if you imagine like a whip, like you're going to whip, you know, a horse or something, whip something like, you know, a whip at one end of the whip is the handle and you as the leader at, are at the handle end and mm -hmm. at the far end is the end of the whip. And every small movement exaggerates and gets bigger mm -hmm. at the end of the individual contributor and task level. Okay. So the longer the, the whip, the further you are up in the organization your small movements, whether it's directives and your communication has reverberating effects. So we could draw the sine wave and, you know, the amplify and the Hertz mm -hmm. and all those other yeah. awesome engineering, engineering terms there. But if you think about it, the higher you go up, the less you should really talk or be directive because those individual phrases and directives have more of an effect the higher you go up. Oh, wow. How did you discover that? One, we all we need to be going to take you back to being a good follower, or a good subordinate. And I think some people call it managing up. I'm not going to talk about managing up. I'm going to talk about being the individual contributor or a leader of smaller teams and being on the receiving end of guidance and direction from your higher level organizational leader and watching one, both positive examples and not so positive examples. You many times in my experience in the military, we talk about, you can learn a lot from a really good leader, but in many cases uh, you can learn a lot more from less than stellar leadership examples. Mm, I see. So, if you're the higher you are and you want something to to occur, there's more layers of leadership that it needs to go to. And it takes longer to steer a large ship than it does a small organization where you're the first line leader of an individual, a group of individual contributors. You can turn to Bob, Billy, Jane, and Joe and say, I, we're, we're going to stop making these things red and we're going to yeah. color them blue. Yeah. And right then and there, it's done. Yeah. But if you're the higher you're up and we're, we're going to stop making red, but we're going to make blue, there's organizational, institutional level systems and processes and resources. Bob, Billy, Jane, and Joe may be able to make a handful of them from red to blue. But at the large organizational level, there's huge investment, whether it's R&D, whether it's factories, whether it's training, and whether it's product line, all those different things. Yeah. That would have to occur at the small level. I could say we're making red to blue today. We can make six of them, but for an entire organization to say we're making red to blue, and then you change your mind up oh, a week later, we're changing blue to green. Oops, I'm sorry, I didn't mean green. We're making yellow. 
Think of the gyrations your organization at the individual contributor level are going to have to go through to try and keep up with you and to implement that permanent change. Right there, you've lost trust and confidence. And I'm not going to have ownership at my level if you're going to keep changing what color you want product to be. Yeah. Yeah. I can sense that decision making is also a very important skill. That that that's one of the skills that you develop as you observe and as as you uh move up and up and and understand the effects and the impacts of your decisions. So it's a your decision making skills and then comes the impact of your decision making skills as you brought it up. I'm glad you brought up decision making, Andrew. That's a that's a great theme and topic. Um and not just your skills or how you make decisions, but what decisions you make. What are your decisions to make? And what are the decisions that you empower to provide guidance for someone who is a leader or manager below you to make? Because if you try to make all the decisions, you end up being that uh, the hand with handle the whip, just making decisions all day long. Yes. And, and you have no the... ownership. Yeah. And you have no ownership right. throughout for someone, another leader to grab, grab in the middle of the whip and say, look, I'm going to make this level decision. So that person over there is not shaking the handle really hard. I'm going to take this, I'm going to make this appropriate level decision yeah. appropriately. So not only how you do that, which is a whole nother discussion we could have, but what are the right level decisions yeah. for you to make? Oh, you're, I mean, I love this point that you're bringing up. Um, it's almost this paradox mindset, paradox thought that the higher you go, actually the less decisions you make and the more the, the, the directional, you, you give the directions, as you said, you're, you, you might be holding, I don't know if, even going to hold the, the handle, but just hear me out. So it's, it's empowering others to make decisions and have ownership accountability that, uh, they have to know, you know, what's the mission, what's the direction we're going and, and why are we doing what we're doing? So if they understand that, then it's almost like at that the higher you go, you don't have to make the the decision like the decisions down to the individual levels. It's those decisions about the mission and the purpose and the why and the alignment. So it it changes. It morphs into different kind of a decision and decision making. And then what you said also when to make decisions and who who's the appropriate the decision making. What an interesting point. I go back to just communication, extremely judicious. And I, I, I brought gave feedback to one boss that said, towards the effect of, so you ought to, see, he came back and said, I sound like a broken record. I so, seem like I'm saying the same thing over and over. I said, that's great, sir, because you're one person and there's 4,423 4, people in this organization. You can only see a handful at a time. And by the time your message goes through all the levels, if you change it too quickly, that initial message will have never gotten to everybody. But if you're on theme and the right level, very judicious communication, the right guidance, the right decisions, the right place and time that empowers other people, you're exactly right. It kind of blows your mind that or have a greater level of responsibility, but you make less decisions and less communication, but they have to be very judicious and they are very impactful. Otherwise, you have the end of the whip and nothing's getting done. And then you yes. go down and check and you're wondering, why isn't anything getting done? And why are you making them red? I I, I changed five, that was five weeks ago. Yes. it's We're on it's, blue, we're on yeah. purple. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of people can relate when you're an individual contributor. It's called the miscommunication. Is is the opposite of what well, I heard red. Yesterday it was blue. The day before it was 
you know, I don't know, green. So I'm throw my hands up. Yeah. It's like, okay, so which one is it? Uh, versus what you're saying, uh, the broken record is actually a, an advantage because I heard the same message. You heard the same message. I, you heard that. So it's, we always, cause we're, we're humans. We like to check in with each other and with our team. So if I'm confused, I go to, you know, my ally or someone on my team and say, okay, so I heard green. Did you hear green too? And if they confirm green, that gives me the confidence of, okay, I, I heard it. The communication is clear. Um, and it gives me the opportunity to have ownership because now I know it's clear, it's green. I got confirmation from there, from there. So I love your point of for leaders to to change their mindset around, communicate it. And even if it feels like a broken record, and even if it feels like you said it a hundred times, remember a hundred times versus, as you said, 4,000 some people, you still have a ways to go. So keep repeating it believe in the message and in the power of of concise judicious and and um and bringing everybody on the same page like that is that is awesome thank you you said something that made me want to underscore the why if you can explain the why so if we take ownership and messaging and guidance or directives the guidance directives, the messaging, and the ownership. If you provide the why, not everybody has to agree with you, but if you have a consistent, logical why and provide the right level of explanation to why we're not doing red, we're doing purple, the why, you can help yourself gain buy-in and ownership. And then in the end, make your job so much easier because you have empowered people by understanding the why. How many times you have you been the you know individual contributor or the manager at a, a certain level? You don't know why we're doing it. It's tough for you to implement and have your team or your team of teams do something. If you don't understand the why, even if you don't agree, but you at least understand the why in the bigger picture. So in the military, we challenge everyone to understand two levels up. What is my boss and my boss's boss's why? Not just for what I'm doing. Two levels up from day one, it's do I understand the context of what I'm doing two levels up and do I understand the why? And if I don't understand the why, I need to ask. And that'll help that leader do some self-reflection on did they provide the right clear, concise guidance? It helps me provide ownership. But more importantly, through ownership, if I understand the why, I can take some initiative, some what we would call disciplined initiative yes. with it that supports the overall why. And I don't have to ask the boss's boss for Beautiful. specific guidance all the time. Yeah. That's how we help empower our organizations and our leaders and our managers at all levels. So how do you challenge? You said that we challenge everyone to know it two levels up. How how do you challenge people? Well, literally as the 23-year-old, you know, my two levels up, that person had, you know, five, six hundred people, right? So my my leaders right below me should know one level from me. So I would point blank ask them. Oh. I should already know it. That's one level for me. And yeah. it's two levels from them. That's their responsibility and duties to understand two levels above them. And then how they fit into the bigger picture. How much more ownership and inspiration and, you know, excitement and dedication do you have if you one, have ownership, two, understand why, three, understand that you are affecting a bigger part of the organization, that you are in line. It's huge. It's, it's yeah. huge. And it's, your response is so simple. And I'm sitting here like, of course, you, you ask, like, why do we need to have a big, complicated and difficult, complex process? You, you keep asking. It's, you ask today, you ask tomorrow, you you check for the alignment with the intention that 
also you communicate the value of why you're asking why you need to know so it's it's not to question someone's ability but to improve someone's ability to help them grow to help them create the understanding because if we both understand we both understand that the understanding gives me the the <clears throat> a, a bigger ownership and bigger confidence to then take initiatives as you mentioned then yeah i would want that raise my hand of course so it's understanding even within the learning of what the benefits will be get the buy in and then let's do it together so you can take here's how we take it to the even next level, Andrea. It's if I'm asking you what is my boss, I'm your your supervisor, and I'm asking you what's my boss's mission, because you know you better know mine, because I'm one level ahead of you. Yes. And then you understand all that. But from your perspective, you have some feedback, something that my boss isn't even seeing. And if you can articulate that and provide your feedback through me. Perhaps you can help this person understand the problem set better. Yeah. And where appropriate, the trust in what you say, the self-awareness of my boss and his humility to make the right change because of something you said and your input. Imagine that level of ownership and level of buy-in. Mm, that is amazing. And I... I... I think that is what keeps people feeling that they belong to an organization, that they're not just part of it, but they belong. They feel included, seen, heard, and empowered. All the things that we've been talking about. Absolutely. It, it, we don't just work for the money. It comes to a, a point where our salaries are satisfying all our needs that we need to take care of and after that is this is what we want we want to wake up in the morning and want to go to work and know where i'm going and know what my mission is and know why I'm, why I'm doing what i'm doing and also have the confidence and the ownership that i will do a good job i will do my best so that i can come home and then be with my family and have that feeling of wow I remember my son when he found out that I when I was working at Boeing that I was helping build airplanes because I found out as you said above me what the company and and two levels up three levels up the mission was and I told him that like mom what are you why do we need to get up so early what are you doing there in that big building in Everett so I told him that I'm I'm helping to build airplanes the ones that take me and you to grandma's house when we go to Europe and his eyes just went wide and you do and from that moment on everybody he met for the next week it was guess what my mom is helping build airplanes those ones up there that you see so he was just so proud and uh, there's something magical when we show our kids that working and having a career and going to work it's not about burnout. It's not about consuming you. It's not about bringing negative energy home, but you are fulfilled um, and you're satisfied and you're energized and you give, you pass that on. So that's also important from, for, uh, for me. So thanks for sharing. Absolutely. A lot of people talk about work-life balance. And I think most people have really good intentions when they talk about work-life balance. I think this is germane to the topic because arguably the higher you go up, the more responsibility you have and the more stress that you can bring into your life. So if people talk about work-life balance, unfortunately, a lot of times I hear, well, I don't have, they, they do it literally in a scale on a balance, like a, you know, with the fulcrum in the middle yes. uh, that well i'm spending this much time at work and i'm not spending enough time at home well let's just let's just do the math you know take away all your sleeping hours how much time are you at work versus not eating or sleeping at home you're probably never going to win that argument so i i challenge with not work-life balance but work-life harmony 
And it's not a cop-out to say that you shouldn't spend more time at home or with your family. It's work-life harmony. Or arguably, how many times have you had an employee or a boss that you've even seen where if their home life is challenging or they've got an immense amount of stress, they bring that into the work life and they're a less productive employee or a less valuable team member. Similarly, if you have a work environment that is hostile or causing too much stress, you bring that into your home life. So I think there's a harmony there if you're feeling, that, as you described, value in helping build airplanes, help fuel value and worthwhile and harmony at home, and was help you explain to your young son why your family made a sacrifice to get up early for whatever reason, for commute or for child care. Yeah. But he saw the value there. There's harmony there versus pitting one against the other. Yeah. And, you know, I've often heard people don't quit their job, they quit their boss. So you, circling it back to the leader and the higher level leader, have some self-awareness and humility to, to reflect the people quit their job or their boss. And on that note, you are you take ownership over your career, your job, your leadership, and your life and your parenting. We all have a choice and just understanding that we have a choice inspires you to then take a choice, make a choice and choose differently if it's a, if it's appropriate. Well, Anthony, we're getting close to the end. So I want to give you the last words, maybe something that I didn't ask you, something that you still want to share. Close it out for us today. I have one, I have a thought and two different phrases that I'd like to share. So one of my, my newfound, um, mentors in my new organization talked about the only two things you can control are your attitude and your effort. You can control your attitude and your effort. Uh, those are very powerful uh, things that I was shared to me most recently. And about a decade ago, I would tell my leaders of leaders, you know, your leadership matters and your attitude is infectious. Make them both positive and engaged. Your leadership matters and your attitude is infectious. Make them both positive and engaged. And on that note, thank you very much, Anthony, for joining me today. You gave me so much to think about. My head is spinning in a good way, a very positive way. I'm going to think and reflect on a lot of things that you shared. So I'm so grateful you joined me today. Thank you again. For having me.